Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dwayne Henderson, and I'm a member of the Cree Lighting Training and Education Team and host of our e-learning series. For those watching live, happy Wednesday. Quickly about the uh, sessions, they'll be 15 minutes in duration once we get started with our presenters. The presenters will stick around for questions, so there'll be a Q&A portion following the presentation. Uh, we do ask participants to submit the questions through either the chat box or the Q&A box as you are all muted uh, during the presentation itself. Um, Wednesdays are industry-related content, and more specifically, that they've been Wellness Wednesday, Wednesdays with uh, Shirley Coyle. And today, we welcome back Shirley for part three of our three-part series on lighting for well-being. Um, Shirley, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Dwayne, and thanks a lot, everybody, for joining. Um, as Dwayne said, this is our final installment in the uh, three-part series. And Shirley, so, before, I, before I let you get into, yep. going too, too far ahead, can you quickly, in case they haven't seen the first two sessions, just real quickly talk about your role in the business? Sure. Um, I'm part of the SPEC sales team, and our team uh, is here to collaborate with and support the lighting designers and lighting consultants out in the community, as well as collaborating and working with our agent partners and the rest of the Cree lighting sales team. So please let us know um, if any anybody on our team, if we can help. My contact information is at the end of the presentation. Perfect, thanks Shirley. So we had divided this um, series into three parts. The first two are already posted on Cree Lighting's YouTube channel. So um, feel free to go back and uh, have a look if there's something you wanna go deeper on in those. For today's third and final installment, we're going to look at case studies related to lighting and human health uh, to get a feel for the results in the field so far and understand which applications seem to be moving ahead. So the three key applications that we've been seeing a lot of activity in this area would be education, healthcare, and office. And with this little chart, I'm looking to try to lay out for the three applications, what kinds of lighting strategies we've been seeing in terms of the design concept, and then what the intent is with those strategies, what, what is the designer or the operator looking to achieve. So, for example, if we look at education uh, in the uh, second column, the strategies we've typically seen so far actually implemented uh, would be tunable white, uh, we're using LED and changing the CCT or changing the spectral content uh, and using that to give visual clues to the students uh, and also using controls so that they can improve the learning environment, uh, dimming, allowing for different, different setups and profiles during the day. In healthcare, uh, we're seeing, again, tunable white light, so LED lighting where we can change the CCT or the spectral content. And these are, the strategy here is usually intended to improve sleep quality or reduce behavioral incidents if it's a, a mental health uh, facility or behavioral facility. Again, controls being used often with the intent of helping staff and their productivity. And then where circadian lighting is being tested out, it's usually intended to help consolidate nighttime sleep for the residents uh, and possibly reduce behavioral incidents as well. And then uh, in terms of meeting, we might see the strategy to meet well building in healthcare as well as in office. And in the case of healthcare, it's to improve the patient and staff experience. When you look at office spaces, again, starting with tunable lighting, typically used to provide time of day sense of awareness for what's happening if you don't have access to natural daylight. The controls, um, those solutions, either giving local control to improve worker satisfaction. Um, some circadian lighting activity is again, giving a sense of the time of day, the passage of the time of day to people who don't have access to natural daylight. And then in terms of the strategy to meet well building, it's often uh, an effort to build the company reputation, whether it's the type of field they're in, uh, they wanna be seen as investing in their employees' wellness, as well as, as making their employees feel appreciated. And keep in mind, the case studies we're going to look at, um, because they've already been published, will be activity that happened four or five years ago, 
So with this being a very dynamic area of research, um, these installations, there's going to be a lag in terms of maybe the technology that's available today versus what's actually been installed. So um, we are looking backwards, which is the nature of looking at case studies. So let's hop into the first couple of case studies under education. And because we have such limited time, I, we're giving the link in here and it will be on the YouTube version as well uh, so that you can go and look at the deeper uh, detailed report for the case studies that interest you. Uh, these are both related to the Department of Energy. Department of Energy has a ton of great resources online uh, if you want to go deeper on these. Uh, the Gateway Program looks at installations and proves out the, the, uh, the concepts um, that, are, that are being tested. So the first of the two school or education settings we're going to look at would be the Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District in Carrollton, Texas. This was a, a three grade school classrooms and in this case, the school was moving from incumbent fluorescent technology. So they were looking to save energy, but on top of that, they were looking to see if there were other considerations that they could do. What, what was the potential going to be for tunable lighting? Could it enhance the teacher engagement with the students and also improve student performance? So they did three grade school classrooms, just general education use tunable white LED systems. And again, the details of whose products were used, who supported the research, all of that is available when you go to the case study online. Um, you'll see the image here showing the classroom under different presets. Uh, so, and the, an image of the controls, uh, a control panel at the bottom, there's one per classroom. So we had four of the buttons that were spectral, uh, they were tied to the CCT. Uh, one, they were labeled as general, which was the, the warmest, the 3000 K, a reading button, which was a little bit cooler at 3500 K, a testing button, which was tied to the 4200 K output, and then an energy setting, which was the highest CCT and the highest output was intended to uh, give energy to the students. So it was the naming of the button. So it might be something you use in that dip after lunch. Uh, the other thing that was available to the teachers, there were four preset buttons, uh, a full setting, which was all lights at full bright. Um, there was an AV setting, which dropped the lights, uh, turned, uh, turned off the lights at the front of the classroom and dimmed the rest of the classroom. Uh, a presentation mode, which put lights at full bright up at the front of the classroom for someone presenting and dimmed the classroom lighting. And then finally a dim setting, which dimmed all the lights down to a 10% level. And there were, were buttons for uh, on off, arrow up and arrow down for the teacher to manually intervene um, to, to change the settings. So the results of this, um, this study was that the teachers tended to use the scene buttons regularly. Those are the, the scenes that were full AV presentation and dim. They didn't use the, the CCT or the spectral power distribution buttons as much. There was some sense that Maybe the naming of the buttons didn't quite match up with what they thought they might want to use and they, they read them, as, interpreted them quite narrowly. So definitely naming the way we label the buttons and what we think about in terms of the controls narrative and the strategy is really important. Um, the teachers did like being able to tailor the lighting of the classroom. They hadn't had access to dimming previously, so they were very happy with that. And they did feel like being able to change the lighting, improve the learning environment. The other education case study uh, that's noted here is Folsom Cordova United School District in Folsom, California. In this case, it was also three grade school classrooms. However, only one was general education. The other two were for autism spectrum disorder students. So they were looking to see how they could use lighting and changing the quality of the lighting, both in, in the amount the, and so for intensity as well as spectral content to see if they could affect behavior. So this was a tunable white LED system. Uh, there were default sets that were the standard daytime lighting, uh, which was the, um, the morning setting was a cooler temperature, the afternoon was um, slightly warmer. There was a CCT slide bar, as you'll see in the graphic down on the left here, where you could move either the down lights or the whiteboard lighting 
from warm 2700K all the way up to 6500K. And there was an element in this case study uh, of designing for circadian. So the goal was to hit 0.3 CS, which is circadian stimulus. Uh, if you're not familiar with that metric, you can um, check the second session of this series that we did that's on, posted on YouTube um, to get some explanation. That's LRC's uh, version of their metric, their model for circadian stimulus. It equates to 30% melatonin suppression. Um, so this would be in the mornings to try to create more energy um, to um, suppress any kind of sleepiness. So the findings in this, the teachers use the color tuning regularly. Uh, they, they use the lighting to cue the students. So instead of talking loudly or using a bell, which they would have done in the past, they use the lighting, which they really liked. They also used a calm, the calm setting, which was the warm lower light. They used that first thing in the day um, and also first thing after lunch to sort of signal a change um, to get the students to settle down. So the teachers found their own strategies for, um, for making use of this. So let's move on to healthcare. Um, we have a couple of examples. The first is an older study uh, that was done in Seattle, Washington for the Swedish Behavior Hospital Behavioral Health Unit. And if you look at the images on the right here, this is the common area, which was for dining as well as daytime activity. And this was a space uh, for people struggling with mental health issues. And it was a combination of voluntary and non-voluntary patients. Um, and they did not have access to daylight, natural daylight for this common area where they spent quite a bit of time. So the thinking was uh, that they wanted to, the designers wanted to try some kind of circadian lighting to give a sense or change in the, both the color temperature and the intensity of the lighting throughout the arc of the day to give them a sense of, of uh, the day passing and hopefully also impact their sleep uh, so they would not have as much sleep disruption. Uh, over time, this was modified a bit. They went back and did uh, changes to the lighting. You'll see in the left-hand side, the graphic there indicates on the, on the 24 hour clock of the day, how the lighting design, uh, how the concept worked versus um, what people would be feeling in the space. So from midnight until six in the morning, it was a very warm light at a low level and then started to come up at dawn and then through the morning was a cooler temperature, again, to try to help them get their um, circadian, um, to have some circadian impact on them, highest light level midday, highest intensity, and then again, scale it back in the afternoon. So one of the issues that um, they came up with in this uh, study was that they were also, the researchers were looking to figure out how to measure and collect data for the, um, for the people in the space um, to come up with the protocols. That's an important part of these early case studies. And that was something they were successful with. They managed to measure for both CS and EML, the other metric we talked about last session and um, figure out how to collect the data and analyze the data also found that they really needed to have um, more energy, allow for more energy use for those hours of the day and make sure there was some headroom in terms of the intensity of the system that was designed. It was a combination of down lights and perimeter lighting that were used. So you see on the left, the daytime, midday, and then the original nighttime on the right. In the end, they decided to shut off as well the down lights at night and found they did not need that much light. So the second healthcare case study I wanted to share with you is the ACC Care Center in Sacramento. Again, this is a DOE um, funded piece of research. So you can find more details on the DOE site with the link. And this is a facility that has um, a high percentage of uh, dementia care patients. Uh, so in this case, they were looking to take the common area, the hallways, in between their rooms and change the lighting to give a sense of the time of day um, for, these, for these patients and see if they could have an impact on their sleep quality. 
So um, following the protocol, um, if you look at the photos here, the nighttime mode uh, was the warmest CCT, that was 2700K, and it was dimmed to 21% output. Uh, the far right is your, is your daytime mode, and that's the coolest um, CCT at 6500K, and it is at 100% output. And in the middle, you'll see the transition. So in the early morning after the nighttime mode, this is what it would go to gradually, 4100K at full output. And then again, after the, after the um, midday mode, when it was at, had been at full bright, it would go back to this 4100K before it transitioned to the nighttime. So with the results of this study, um, they found that tuning and dimming at the nighttime lighting did help um, with reducing the sleep disturbances for the res residents. There was some impact in reducing behavioral incidents, but um, not as big an impact um, as there had been on the sleep. But they were the success of this case study was that they were able to establish the methodology for collecting light exposure data and measuring CS and EML. And finally, a couple of quick office case studies. I would suggest um, if you're looking at doing a, a well design, there are some there are resources on the well building website, well building standard website that gives you examples of different case studies. So this first one was the um, Kindle office, which is a uh, multidisciplinary engineering firm in the UK, um, and they were the first European. Um, the first European certification for well building. And, and really, they, for the lighting concept, uh, they did the primary thing that we always talk about is that you want to start with the daylighting and make the maximum usage of the natural daylight in the space. And then in addition, they added sensors, uh, daylight harvesting sensors that would reduce or increase the light levels based on whether daylight was present. And this was certified at the gold level. The second office application is the Arup office in Boston. Uh, this is again a multidisciplinary um, firm, engineering, um, architects, designers, planners, uh, and they started again with the daylight, made best use of that, use of that, and then for the electric lighting, they wanted to make sure that the employees who didn't have access to daylight were stuck inside, like most of us, all day. Uh, that they had a sense of the day by using dynamic color tuning. It was still white light, but uh, gave people a sense of the natural rhythm or arc of the day. Uh, so they were able to, they wanted to do this to promote the employee feeling of, of knowing what time of day it was roughly, and also to allow people to have a more gentle start to their day, have higher light levels in the late morning um, to give them energy and then allow them again to wind down at the, en at the end of the day. So final slide here to wrap things up. We wanna think about the kind of considerations when you're looking at lighting for, for human health. Um, very important to make sure that you can, if you're, if you're trying to have an impact beyond just the visibility, we're going to need to increase the expectations on energy at least for a few hours a day in the late morning. So to meet those guidelines, that needs to be part of the discussion and the design plan uh, because you need to light beyond, um, beyond just lighting for the vis visible, uh, visible task. In considering guidelines, look to the well building standard, the UL design standard, and stay tuned for other consensus based standards like the IES who are working on theirs. Um, this is a fluid area, but there are some things to look at right now. We also want to keep an eye on, on the um, case study um, that, that is building out over time. Uh, we need to see replication of results to know that, that things are working but they're a good way to see what things have been tried uh, and take some things into consideration on your own project. Uh, in terms of the time that's taken, it's important to, for designers to make sure that they're allowing for the hours involved. There are a lot more calculations, um, so you need extra design time and corresponding budget um, for that because there are a lot of additional calculations and looking at the number of viewpoints and possible directions and all the spectral reflectances, the detailed calculations are significant. 
And the final thing would be in terms of an approach on the equipment and the actual lighting specification is to try to build in as much flexibility in, you know, using uh, color tunable systems, controls, open APIs where possible so that you can future proof your design to use with other software that is coming along out there and allowing the headroom, as we mentioned, to increase from the minimum light level for the vis visual task to allow, in, in addition, lighting for circadian, biological, and behavioral effects. So that's it for the final session. Um, for now, that's it for light, lighting and human health. There'll be more to come in the future. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll be posting this segment in the next 24 hours on the Cree Lighting YouTube channel. I'll stay on the line now to see if there are any questions. And Dwayne, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in here. Um, a couple of them are asking about, is there any data that reviews employee productivity as, as it relates to winding down? And, 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 and maybe if I'm, I own the building, do I want the employees winding down and becoming less productive maybe towards the end of the day? So any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd say we don't really have any data. A lot of this is very subjective and anecdotal. Part of our problem is uh, most people don't want to spend the money to do the baseline condition in the first place. So before you make the change or how, whatever they were doing previously, you would need to do some significant um, data collection ahead of time. Um, and it is a very subjective thing. So yeah, certainly the the impact of circadian lighting is much more of a, to be measured in more of a healthcare setting where patient outcomes and nurse um, staff productivity would be a bigger issue. But of course, there are a lot of confounding factors um, that would have to be taken into consideration. There are other variables, um, for example, the current situation that, that we're all living under um, can, can make a big difference in the numbers. So I think we'll see more of that as we go. It's certainly the spaces where people are sleeping in the space. So in healthcare settings or residential settings where people are there 24 hours a day, where it's going to be more critical to get that measurement. If somebody's just coming into the office to work their shift, um, then there's not going to be as much ability to control what you certainly can't control what light they're getting outside of that work experience. So you can't be um, as effective in, in impacting their circadian rhythm. Really more just giving them a sense of the passage of the day is, is probably the priority in an office. Yeah, and a kind of a related question is, is that we have is in, a, in an office or production environment, are health and well-being metrics the same as, as productivity? So I, th I think, you know, some of that stuff is, is, is trying to get the people to be healthier and, and as an owner of a, of a space, perhaps if they're, you know, getting needed rest, they come in well rested and, and ready to produce. But I don't know if you have anything additional yeah. to add. To that I think story. we'll start, we'll probably start to see Dwayne in, um, in industrial light manufacturing, once we do some baseline um, studies, we'll start to be able to see, and you know, maybe it has an impact on safety, reduction of safety incidents, um, that kind of thing that would be more meaningful. Um, but it, it's very nebulous for, for office workers in terms of measuring productivity, since most of us are not um, measured on that. But certainly employee retention, those kinds of things over a longer time frame. It's really challenging to get the people who install these systems to track over the long term and, and then look at their retention rates and those kinds of things. So, Shirley, there's also a, a, a question is, is asking to def define the term that you used, uh, open API. And we're going to have a, a session in the future on this in, in deeper oh. detail, but maybe just a, kind of a, at, the, at the surface, just a, a quick definition of that. Sure, quick definition. I apologize for not giving that in the in the um, when mentioning a, a term like that. Um, it's an application programming interface, and if you think about an example, would be if you're using um, if you're using something like Uber, um, an application. They don't have all the maps. They haven't gone out and created all the maps. Somebody uh, like Google has done that, and they would work uh, when when you send your location, it's going to go out. It's kind of uh, going to go out and use an API to go access the maps and figure out where you are and use that programming. Uh, same thing when you go to book a, a hotel uh, and you're on the Marriott platform, they don't actually have all the maps that tell you, you know, where all their hotels are. But when you click on that in the 
in, in their website, it's going to use an API to go out and get the mapping information. Uh, so it's a way to link uh, the lighting system uh, controls to other software. So if somebody's doing something, an example in lighting would be that uh, if you're trying to book your conference rooms, um, there would be an open API that would allow for it to connect to a piece of software that actually does the booking of the conference room. So um, you don't have to build out all the software yourself. You use an API, and if you have open protocol in your the way you've designed your your uh, controls, then you can easily work with other people, other programs, to take advantage of their software capability with an open API. Perfect. Thanks, Shirley. And again, for those that are interested, we will be having a future session that will go much deeper on, on that. Shirley, there was a question about, you know, controls wireless versus hardwired in terms of achieving these types of, of solutions. You want to comment on that? Yeah, I think it's... More it, wireless um, today, you think, or...? Yeah, we're certainly seeing uh, more wireless, and it will just depend on the, uh, you know, a lot of these case studies, if we look at them, they are retrofit situations, so wireless is certainly um, the least friction is the, is the way, way to go. Um, there may be some particular construction issues, depending on the type of facility or in a healthcare facility where you um, um, may be required to do something else because of concerns about, about EMI. But, in general, we're seeing, um, you know, it's really the, the choice of whoever's designing the building, uh, but we're seeing a lot more in wireless, yeah. yeah. There's also another question on the winding down comment about, you know, people being too sleepy when they, when they leave to go home. Do you want to comment on that real quickly? I don't think it's that immediate, right, that we're, we're kind of preparing them for, for maybe later in the day rather than right as they leave, correct? Yes, absolutely. I would... I would say that would be more of a, you know, the employee who's still still there at, at uh, seven o'clock or working a, a later shift. Um, you're right. We don't we don't want them to be sleepy for the drive, but you also um, don't want to have the the six thousand k um, higher uh, short short um, short wavelength lighting uh, blaring at them before they go home, and then they won't be able to settle once they do get home. So. Um, I think I've heard yeah, too sometimes, surely, maybe well, it's like shift workers, there's another, you know, very difficult space to kind of manage, but but maybe if you're a shift worker, you know, giving them enough to be alert enough, maybe changing the spectrum or strategy around having them be alert enough to get home, but not so alert, like drinking a bunch of coffee where maybe they can't get to sleep right away yeah. either. So I think there's some interesting strategies around all of this that that um, that will be, you know, see how it all unfolds. Yes, and in something like our Cadian Dynamic um, Skylight, we have in the healthcare profile that's that's one of the standard profile that's already programmed into the SmartCast software. It allows for three shifts, um, so that the person who's working in the, in the you know their shift is from uh, three to three in the morning, and, and they they would actually start and have more light at the appropriate time so that they can try to stay stay on a shift, and then in those cases, um, the advice to those workers would be to wear sunglasses as they're going home so they're not getting a bunch of daylight into their eyes as they're driving home so they can go home and go right to bed. So there's multiple sure, strategies. One last question and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. We're getting, we're getting towards the end of it here. But uh, in terms of Cree uh, lighting, wireless uh, or tunable light solutions, you talked a little bit about, about Cadient. Do you want to talk about uh, what else we can do today within, within this space? Yeah, so we have a, a couple of different options. We've got the um, CR series um, choppers that are uh, have adjustable color um, that you can you can use to go along with that um, to do color tuning, and then the stylus um, as well. We can we can do color tuning. So um, and we've got more coming. So it's uh, there are some great things you can do. I would talk to our okay. applications group. Sure, I think the, la the last comment before we kind of wrap up is, and you kind of started to think in the first session, just make certain people are thinking about it, because if you don't think about it, you're still impacting people with the solutions that we're, we're implementing, right? So I think that's yes, something correct. we Yes, correct. We do hear people saying they're concerned about even stepping into circadian lighting because they uh, don't want to do any harm, but I think the the statement from Well Building is that we're, we are already knowingly putting people uh, for a full day under lighting that's way too dim in these settings. So um, the feeling is that we're already doing harm. This is let's let's try to take some steps to do less harm and try to 
give people um, more of the um, light that, that is needed during the daytime. Perfect. All right, Shirley, well, thank you so much for your, your time in all three sessions. A really great job. Really enjoyed, you know, listening to you and talk about this important topic for the, uh, for the industry. So if you want to advance to, to the next slide, Shirley, we'll wrap it up. Well, thanks. It's been fun. Thank you. All right, so just to kind of give you a heads up as to what's coming on Friday, we'll have an introduction to Simply Snap. So it's another control option that uh, Creo Lighting that we are now offering. So we'll learn a little bit more about that. And then on Monday next week, our design um, content will be around street lighting. And then as we shift away from lighting for well-being on next Wednesday session, uh, we'll, we'll dive into understanding TM30. So that's kind of a glimpse as to what's coming. I want to thank everybody again for joining us. Uh, remind you that. All the uh, presentations are being recorded and posted to our YouTube channel, so please uh, go there and look for additional content if you didn't see them all. And also, we'd, we'd invite you to subscribe to that content as well. In addition, if you have any additional feedback, please feel free to reach out to me as well. So again, with that, thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of your day.